Okay, so welcome. Uh, welcome to finding your path to a job and a career in sustainability. We have a panel of helpers uh, and I'm gonna introduce all, the, all of them in a minute. Uh, first, I'm gonna walk through our agenda for tonight. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is uh, introduce our folks and talk about finding a job in the context of sustainability. Uh, we're gonna do a little exercise in finding and exploring your path. We're then gonna talk about networking and job search strategies. Uh, we'll continue with talking about resumes and cover letters that make us stand out. We'll then have a very short break uh, for about five minutes. We'll then come back and talk about interview techniques and tips. Uh, we'll, talk from, we'll talk about learning from the process and we'll talk about landing a job and negotiating a contract. If you have questions at any time, you can ent enter them into the chat and uh, there'll probably points throughout this where we will also have some live Q&A as we're moving along and we find the time. So uh, before we get started, does anyone have questions? Any burning questions? You can you're all muted now, so you can unmute yourself and uh, you can re-mute yourself while, while things are going, but if you need to ask a question, unmute yourself. Okay, great. So in a moment, I'm gonna have each of these folks introduce themselves uh, for, for a few minutes or a few seconds. Uh, we have Katie Woolman, the LR Career, Career Center Director. We have Brendan Newberry, who is a sustainability career coach. We have Cheryl Foltz um, from Sierra Nevada Brewing. She's a human resources partner. And we have Charles Niedenbach, who is an MSS alumnus. Uh, and he works for Office Depot as a sustainability solutions manager and is a recent grad, recent grad relatively recent. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to having them share a word in a moment, uh, but I'm going I'm to say uh, something about the context, and you all know the context, so I don't even really need to say this with this group, um, but we are living in a world that um, is experiencing some severe challenges, at, and, uh, and they're compounding each other, um, and these are systemic problems, and, uh, and we're trying to find a way to build a world where all of us can flourish and we can move towards sustainability. And, uh, and so with that in mind, there's a little bit of urgency in the work that we do. There's a whole lot of purpose and meaning in the work that we do. Uh, and then there's a, whole, uh, there's a lot of creativity in thinking about sustainability and the ways in which we might enter that work world. And I'm gonna stop my share there and I'm gonna go and introduce and spotlight uh, starting with Katie Woman, um, Katie, why don't you just say hello? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to join this panel and this discussion tonight. I am the Director of Career and Professional Development at Lenore Ryan University, and it is my joy to help our students and alumni to uh, do some of the things we're going to talk about tonight, uh, become aware of their strengths and how they can market those strengths on their marketing materials, how they can conduct a job search, networking in the career areas that they are interested in. And it's such a joy to work with our Little Orion students because they're very passionate about what they're studying and I get to help them reach those goals. So uh, that's what I do. And I'm happy to share what I know with the panel and the participants. And I'm sure I will learn a lot tonight as well. So thank you for the invitation to be here. Thank you so much. I'm going to add Brenda into the mix. Brenda, you can say hello. Hello. So I'm Brenda Newberry and I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, as a career coach, I help people with self-discovery and career direction. I did teach a course in career decision making at the University of Cincinnati and I facilitated a workshop series called Creating Work You Love. I was struck by our environmental issues about two and a half years ago. I had my wake up moment and shifted my focus toward work and sustainability. And today I'm gonna to facilitate a connection conversation that comes from the work of Peter Block and Six Conversations That Matter. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, next, I'm gonna have Cheryl introduce herself. Uh, I'll add her to the spotlight. Hey everybody, I'm Cheryl Fultz. I live in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I work as an HR partner at Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Um, the title can also be considered an HR business partner, but HR partner is my role at Sierra Nevada. And so 
the function of my role um, is to focus on the relationship between the manager and the employee. And that's, that's generally what we do. Um, we also assist with the manager if they wanna do a restructure, um, highlight high potential employees and find career paths. But one of the things that I don't get to do as much as I would like is connect with employees when they want to talk about career growth. We have a recruiting team that sort of manages that piece, but um, I love those conversations and, and still have them. They're exciting and um, yeah, just really look forward to uh, tonight's information. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks for being here. We, we love that. And we're going to add Charles to the spotlight. Thanks, Keith, and hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. This is Charles Neidenbach, and I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm currently working as the Sustainability Solutions Manager with Office Depot. And um, I'll just start by saying what a time to be in the sustainability field. Um, it is the most attention that I've seen in my short career in corporate sustainability on the sustainability and ESG space. And so I'm absolutely thrilled for you. Um, I think it's a brilliant decision to take the time to have this important discussion tonight. Um, so I commend you all for coming. And I'm really excited to share a little bit about my story that hopefully will provide a little bit of inspiration and maybe a little bit of insight into um, something that might resonate with you where you are along your journey. Excellent. That sounds great. Well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn, turn things over to Brenda for a moment. And, uh, and I'm going to do that uh, to have her kick off uh, some, some finding your path discussions. And we're going to get into some breakout groups, but I'm going to let Brenda take over. Okay, thanks. So uh, first, I'm going to set up what we're going to do in our breakout groups. Then we're going to break out and then we'll come back and do a little reflection. Um, if you don't quite follow along with what I'm saying, don't worry about it. You're getting what you need and in the breakout groups, you'll be fine. So um, in just a few minutes, we're going to put you in groups of three or four people. I think we've got the right numbers to go into three. We'll give you a question and you each get to respond. When one person's talking, the others listen and focus on what the person is saying. Get curious. Listening is really the point of this process. So replace certainty with curiosity, no advice giving, fixing, or even offering resources, unless you connect with them and do that later. When the speaker pauses, ask, can you tell me more? Or why is that important to you? Let the speaker choose what to expand on. If you can ask one or two times, why is that important to you? some bit of insight may happen. It may even surprise the speaker what they say. So it's really a dropping in, going a little deeper moment. And then when you're finished, you can say, I'm complete, but don't let them off the hook. If they don't, they need at least one, tell me why that's important to you. Now the distinction of this question is invitation. So I'm gonna offer a connection question that completes the invitation that you accepted by being here. This brings every voice into the room. It, when you have connection before content, it helps us deepen our conversations quickly. So the question that I'm gonna offer is powerful in that it's ambiguous, meaning each person defines it in their own way. There are no right or wrong answers. It's personal to you and it evokes a bit of anxiety. If there's no edge to the question, there's no power. The question brings aliveness and ownership to the conversation we came here to have. Make sure you introduce yourselves in your breakout groups. Some of you do not know each other. When you speak, speak from the heart and passing is always allowed. Changing your mind later is okay. <laughs> um, we're gonna give you 10 minutes. It's gonna feel like not enough, but it's plenty. Keith is gonna put a message up when we're halfway through to help you manage your time and then the usual one minute to go message pops up. Um, after we do the breakout, we'll come back together and reflect. So here's the question and I will put it in the chat box. It's not that long. 
Why was it important for you to be here? Notice this is also a finding your path kind of question. You get to say why it's important for you to be here. So we're ready for the breakout. I'll put this in the chat and you'll have 10 minutes once you're in there. Excellent. Okay, I'll like you again. Great, it looks like everybody's here. So um, we're gonna reflect on what you just experienced. And my question is, what struck you? So not like reporting out on what happened or what someone said, but more, what was your experience? And we're gonna hear from a few people because that's enough to get a sense of what 80% of the people experienced. And um, what's a good way for them to raise their hand or should they just unmute and speak? We've got a small crowd, so if they just unmute and speak, I think that okay. should work. Great. Who would like to share? What struck you? What struck me was that Christy and Allison had some pretty strong and awesome paths that they were on, you know, or are on, whether it's like focused on biology or French, and then sustainability shows up and it's like, oh, well, maybe I'll go this way, so. Thanks, Andrew. I could jump in and, and say I was struck by um, how Veronica had unearthed some skills that she had previously perhaps not culled or really channeled. And that was cool to see, uh, in a sense, the, you know, passion manifesting, <clears throat> manifesting and, and um, a willingness to nudge deeper into areas based on within the, within the capacity of writing, nonfiction writing. That was very cool. Great. Let's hear from at least one more. I'll jump in. Um, I was struck by how similar many of us in this program are in terms of whether you know or not, you know, the path you kind of want to take, there is this passion towards wanting to help others know as you learn about sustainability. Um, and I think a lot of people who have some other passions, you know, really come into this, like, you know, acupuncture is, is good for people and, you know, and then translating what, what, we can do in terms of for the earth and for other people. You know, it's a, I feel like it just is a great community that comes together for sustainability. Great, great. Well, that probably covers it for most of us. So Keith, do you want to take it? I'll take it. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate that. And I think, uh, you know, the journey is, uh, is, is ongoing and we are here to support you in that journey, especially me and, and probably Katie. Um, and as we uh, move forward, you know, those conversations and, and beyond. So, you know, Charles is on the journey and I'm going to turn to Charles next. Um, and the next section is on networking and job search strategies. And I'm, we're going to start by having Charles just share a little bit about what happened with him. And then we're going to talk uh, about strategies in general across the panel. So I'm going to uh, make you the spotlight, and uh, I think we should still be able to hear you. So you're on, Charles. Thanks. Everyone can hear me? Yeah. Great. Awesome. So yeah, and um, thanks, everyone. Just want to share a little bit about you know how my journey went coming from um, my pro from finishing the program and then onward. Um, and also some exploration phases that I'm sure many of you are experiencing as you go through the program. Um, so my background was in, in the bio, biological sciences. I thought I wanted to be a doctor um, and then had a series of events throughout a throughout, uh, couple years in college where I realized that 
um, I didn't want to do medicine or dentistry, and I had a, a broader calling uh, that ended up in the sustainability program. So fast forward through the program, and I'm at a space where, you know, needing to take that next step and apply uh, the knowledge and the, the career skills um, that we learn in our program into real life um, job scenario, and what does that look like? So for me, um, I was working in the wine industry uh, in hospitality for a couple of years um, and thought I wanted to go down that path, did a lot of networking and engagement in that space, but then came to realize that my desire to have a career in sustainability went back into uh, the sustainability business um, and decision-making, I think, class, uh, where we explored deeper the intersection of how business can be a force for good in the world. And so as I worked through this understanding and um, tried to do more introspection about where my skills and where my uh, interests lie, it started to lead um, towards a path uh, more focused around the corporate space. And I heard in the breakout, you know, um, a lot of conversation about skills and interest and focus areas and wanting to lean into those. So I'd start by saying that having that conversation and understanding introspectively what, where do I want to show up in the world and what are the skills that I bring to the table that can help this vision that I have manifest. Um, and so for me, that looks like uh, reaching out to corporate sustainability um, folks. And that meant uh, reaching out to volunteer at the Green Biz uh, event, which is one of the largest sustainability conferences uh, in the world. And uh, volunteering at that event started this process of networking, beginning to understand what the culture is like in the corporate sustainability space, because that's something that I didn't fully understand coming out is what is the, what is the lingo like? What, what are people talking about? Um, how do people interact? Is this a laid back culture? You know, are they willing to have a beer? Or are they more, a little bit more stuck up? Um, and so understanding those cultural dynamics through networking and exposure in the space was really important for me from the beginning. Um, as I continued along my journey and frankly was becoming very frustrated with not being able to felt like, feel like I could get much traction. Um, and that came through you know, applying to jobs and applying to jobs but not really understanding why I wasn't being considered any further than just receiving a no. Um, and so that then led to more questions um, and more specifically needing to humble myself um, and understand that just because I have a master's in sustainability does not mean that I get put into a role in corporate sustainability. And so that for me was, a, was an eye-opening moment where I realized that I needed experience in the space. I needed sustainability associated with my name and on my resume, and I needed to figure out how to do that. And so through networking with the individuals in the sustainability space, I took an internship position with UPS um, and on their sustainability team. So it was a sustainability internship position, which for me was a little bit, um, I guess, unconventional because I was one of the older sustainability interns that they had had. I was coming into the program with a master's degree. Other interns were in uh, undergrad, um, but going through that internship achieved something that was very important, which was having exposure and starting the path to gaining experience in the corporate sustainability space. 
And I should say that while my story is centered around this business and sustainability intersection, and while that will manifest, whether you're in nonprofit work or um, any other work, you have to have some foundational relationship building and business skills. Um, I just want to say that th this story was unique to me, so keep that in mind. Um, but taking a step back, humbling myself, t getting an internship, and then doing some of the, the grunt work, um, the next position I had was actually as a secretary. Um, so I took a front desk position uh, with a finance tech company um, called Prime Revenue in Atlanta. I did not foresee taking a, a secretary front desk role after coming out of UPS with a, with a sustainability internship. But again, this was a, a wake up call to say, Charles needs experience and practical real world examples that he can provide on his resume and to recruiters to show that I have what it takes to come into a corporate sustainability role. Um, we're gonna talk about this a little bit more too when it comes to highlighting yourself on a resume, et cetera. But one of the things that I, I want to, to drive home here is um, don't be afraid to highlight yourself and put yourself in the spotlight. And I was timid to do that at first, thinking, well, you know, I don't really, I didn't really lead that project or, you know, I'm not really sure if my creation of a um, commuter program as a front desk secretary really ties into sustainability. But I learned that you have got to learn, you've got to figure out a way how to tie it in. And so one example of that is I led a, a commuter policy as the front desk person. Well, it turns out you can highlight that as project management skills. You can highlight it as um, sustainability by reducing um, carbon emissions from commuter, um, you know, from commuters coming to work. You can highlight it from a from an employee engagement standpoint, so hosting surveys, um, some of these foundational skills that were important to the job that I'm in now. So again, bringing in and not being afraid to say, I did this, this is project management. These are all of these big important pieces that I'm sure you're seeing if you are looking at sustainability job postings. Um, the second piece is once you're once you feel emboldened and empowered to do that, um, put it on your resume and use the words that are in the job description in your resume. Um, the the piece that was very humbling for me is I felt confident if I could get to the interview stage, but I could not get past the computer bot that were reading my resume. And so I had to be very um, articulate and clear about the words that appeared in my resume so that they could get caught by the computer bots that first read and filter out everybody else before you get to an initial interview. Um, so the third piece of my journey along the networking and job search phase actually ended with a, a career uh, group called LHH, uh, Lee Hick Harrison, which is a career placement type group. Um, they were able to help, um, and this was put on by a previous employer to help with resume building, writing, um, but ultimately they helped me get into a virtual career fair, which is the third point that I'll leave you with is the Virtual career fairs, which is where we are now, right? Career fairs are invaluable to you landing a job because during career fairs, you get to show your skills to a recruiter, both in your resume and also even just a minute or two of chatting. You have a tremendously unique space being in sustainability that is different from finance, HR, 
um, IT, any other field, sustainability is very unique and you have the opportunity to leverage that, especially for those recruiters that are out there trying to find sustainability professionals. So leverage those career fairs, those opportunities to get specifically in front of uh, recruiters, because that's really where the rubber meets the road from the networking and job search standpoint. At least that's what it was for me. Um, so I'm not sure how long I've been talking here, but I'll pause there and turn it back um, back to Keith. And I know we're going to have some more perspective. That's great. I, uh, that's a really wonderful journey to share. I think there, that there's a lot there's a lot of great insights in there. Um, but I think what we'll do is we'll move through and see if Katie wants to build on that. And, and at some point, I, I would like to hear a little bit more about what you do day to day. But let's move on to Katie for uh. now. Back to that. <laughs> We'll come back to you, to hearing about that, um, Katie. Can can we move over to you and 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 have you add anything from your perspective on uh, the job search itself and networking and and that piece? I will. Absolutely, and I just I think it's so powerful to hear individual stories because it's really it brings uh, things that I might say to life uh, and and. Um, and it just reinforces what I tell our students. So I love hearing your story, Charles. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for um, sharing the humility that you had to experience and the, um, the, the willingness that you had to start wherever you needed to start. You know, I think that's something that we really need to be open to in our, in our thinking about our career in the first place. I'm a fellow pre-med major that... <laughs> quickly after a couple of chemistry classes veered off in a different direction. So, you know, I think it's really important in our, uh, as we're looking at, you know, what, what, how we want to serve the world and how we want to fulfill our purpose to be a little bit open with that. Um, and that's the case with job searching as well. Um, it's very hard to nail dream job straight out of the gate, folks. So, you know, I think mm -hmm. it's really great to be open to doing things like Charles was suggesting, volunteering. Uh, and I, and that's a big suggestion that I'll give to alumni who are searching, who might be feeling frustrated hey, I have my degree, I want to be paid. I get it, you know, yes, and eventually you will be, but, it, you know, volunteering is a great way to develop your network, and I'm, you know, I think it's really important that we're talking about networking as a, as a big part of job searching. Often the clients that I work with assume that because the internet is so prevalent, that's all they need to focus their energy on in a job search, and as Charles explained, that's, that's, that's not the case. Yes, we need to be looking online, and there are some fabulous resources out there for folks in sustainability, great directly targeted jobs boards. Uh, Kaylee Cross shared a wonderful set of resources with me that now we have in the Career Center that we can share with future students. So those are out there and they're great. The more targeted your jobs boards are that you're looking at, that's wonderful. Um, anytime you can sign up for job alerts, that then they'll email you when something is posted that you're interested in, that helps you be more proactive in your job search. Those are great, and we definitely need to take advantage of those, but we need to spend a lot of our time networking and being very strategic with that. And I encourage our graduate students uh, and prospective graduate students to start networking now. You know, that's something you can definitely start doing now. It is time consuming. You schedule an appointment with somebody, then you have to reschedule, and then you have to, you know, this and that. And um, so, uh, you know, that is definitely a big piece of you preparing to enter into this career, going ahead and developing your network. And there's some great resources for that, your professors, your fellow classmates, the Career Center. We can tap into our alumni network and see if anybody is working in something that you're interested in in your geographical area. And one of the greatest tools I would encourage you, um, if you are uh, an introvert like myself <laughs> that may have a hard time uh, just starting a conversation with a stranger. Let me give you a great tool, and that is uh, asking for informational interviews. Uh, this is a great way to initiate a meeting with someone that you either don't know at all or don't know very well, and most people have never heard of an informational interview, so you're going to have to explain what it is uh, likely to this person, but it's a great tool for you to get some information about the career field that you are interested in. 
get some advice, you know, hey, what are some jobs boards out there that you found effective? Or what are some professional associations you would recommend that I join? That's a great idea as a grad student. You get a discount on those memberships as a grad student. So that's a great thing to do. And it's a conversation where you're gaining a lot of information. If you Google informational interviews, you'll find some great guides out there. Uh, we have a few that we recommend. And you, uh, yes, are asking a lot of questions, getting a lot of information, but you're also able to start showcasing your communication skills, uh, showcasing your professionalism. It's the start of potentially a great networking relationship that you can create. And so that is an excellent tool that when I'm working with a student who's in an active internship or job search, you know, I recommend set a goal for yourself, maybe one new networking contact every two weeks or maybe one a month, you know, something attainable for you. Uh, but make it a goal because it's easy to not do it. <laughs> it's easy to go, oh, I don't have time, or oh, that makes me nervous, or oh, I don't know who to contact. Um, but once you get the ball rolling, and especially if you have a great conversation with someone, uh, then a, a, another question you can ask is, do you have any other contacts that could be as helpful as you were today? I'd love to expand my network in this field. And they're very likely, after they've gotten to know you a little bit, share more contacts with you, share more resources. So that's a great great way for you to start stepping your toe into a career field you may have no contacts in. Uh, and so that is definitely something I would recommend that people do. And then, uh, you know, just reiterating a lot of what Charles said, uh, be open to volunteering. This is a great time, I believe, to engage in this type of work. And it, excitingly, there are initiatives in, in every city, in every county. Uh, and again, if you're not sure where to start, um, you can reach out to your professors at LR and they have lots of great ideas, uh, fellow classmates. But it's, it's never too early to get involved. And look, I know you're a busy grad student or you may have lots on your plate. I understand that, uh, but this is definitely something that is worth your time. It's not something you need to wait to do after you graduate. It's something you can be doing early and often. And Charles also gave a great tip that we may talk about later. Um, go ahead and even before you're in an active job search, go ahead and look for job postings. You can see what the requirements are. You can see what the qualifications are. If you see any gaps in your skill set or your resume, it'll give you time to develop those in graduate school. One of my favorite parts of being in graduate school myself was asking my professors if I could customize the assignment based on what I was interested in. And more often than not, they would say, sure, do that. If that's something you're interested in, go for it. And so I was able to tailor a little bit of my curriculum to what I was really interested in. So I would encourage you to feel empowered to do that so that you're not, again, waiting till last semester to do your job search, but you're considering that it starts now and building your network, mm -hmm. building your skill set, building that resume in creative ways starts from the moment you are in graduate school. And so I would encourage you to embrace those opportunities. And everybody in this Zoom room right now, you've already got to step in the right direction because you joined us tonight. So, um, and those of you who are watching this in the, in the future, uh, that's a, this is a good step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Great, great set of uh, advice and uh, ideas to share with all of us. And uh, certainly networking is huge. It's so important and there are many ways to do it. Uh, I'm not sure if Cheryl or Brenda have anything to add. Do you, do you, or do you want to wait until an, another session? section. Cheryl? Um, just a, a, a lot of agreeing and head nodding with what both Katie and Charles said. Charles, I, I really agree with what you said about kind of humbling yourself and taking a job that, that has rounded out your skills. Um, I think that receptionist job is huge. And at Sierra Nevada, um, the receptionist's have the most variety of contact because they're usually connected with a lot of leaders and then a lot of connections outside of the organization. And you start building relationships just through that. And then just a, a really nice view of what the different business units of the company do. So I, I love that you did that. And I think that was so, so wise. I also loved, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit 
really examining that job posting. And Katie, you mentioned this too. Um, I've, I, I think understanding what that job is actually um, requiring and what you do is so huge um, just to understand what the job is to go into that interview process really with with a lot of knowledge of what it what it's what it's looking for and then if you have questions if you have a you know the recruiter can answer all kinds of questions if, if something's unclear but it's just examining and really getting to know that that position that you're applying for yeah. excellent Thank you. Brenda, any, any additional? Yeah, this is, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, I've, I've only gotten jobs through networking. Whatever you're going to talk about for resumes and all that, I've done it all, but this is the only way I've gotten jobs. Um, I was a salesperson in my prior life, so a lot of this is very sales-oriented. But if you think of it, not sales like pressuring something to do, to somebody to do something, sales from developing relationships, finding out what people are really interested in and trying to meet those needs. So one of the things I heard about networking way back when, and it really stuck with me, is how helpful weak acquaintances can be. Like sometimes a weak acquaintance will go to bat for you in a way that somebody really knows you well won't. Mm. And then this whole idea of networking, it's worth a study in and of itself. But what I would call it is cultivating relationships. And once you've had that one networking meeting, I don't know what your percentages are. You're lucky if it's half of those people feels like it's worth another conversation, but circle back a month later, find a reason to be back in touch, find a reason to get involved in something they're involved in, find a reason to show up in the same space that they're in. I know I offer more assistance to the people who keep coming back. You know, it's like they earn my level of assistance by their follow-up, their persistence, maybe offering me something of value. Um, and then when you do show up at those volunteer opportunities, just do a great, great job. Whatever your job is, just take it on to be excellent. Mm -hmm. People notice that you don't even know or noticing. And you you might be good at something that really has nothing to do with what a future job role is that you want, but you get perceived as someone who shows up and does a good job and it's transferable. So those were my thoughts. Excellent. Thank you so much. These are all wonderful insights. Uh, I'll just say something really briefly about networking and the many networks we can tap into. One of the things is uh, geography sometimes dictates where we can ha get a job. Uh, and so you, there are local networks and then there are wider networks. And I wouldn't ignore the wider networks, even if you're looking only locally, because there are opportunities sometimes to get a local version of a job that is uh, for something that's more national. And so, um, so there are organizations like the International Society for Sustainability Professionals that is global, and yet you might find something that, um, you know, there, that there, there are job postings in there and there might be opportunities to connect with people that you might otherwise not have communicated with. And so that's just something to consider. But thank you all on that panel. We're gonna Keith, we're we're gonna move Keith, on. Just, talking. Go go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say because I think this is important. We're at a time too where virtual jobs are the thing, right? Mm -hmm. So don't limit yourself to one particular local yeah. job search area because you never know when that job that's on a broader job board or job search is virtual. Great point. Great point. Thank you. Um, I think if you have questions about that, do enter them into the, uh, the, the chat, but we're going to move on to talking about resumes and cover letters. And I'm going to spotlight Katie to lead this one off. How's that sound? Sounds great. So <clears throat> something that I want to lead with as we transition to talking about resumes and cover letters and LinkedIn, those tools in our toolkit, to help us get to that next great opportunity. As we're thinking about those job postings that we're looking at, I just want to let everybody know um, that most of the employers that I've talked with over the years are a lot more flexible with their requirements than that job description might look. So don't wait till you have 100% of the qualifications 
for that job to apply. And don't wait till it's the perfect job, perfect location, perfect everything. You don't know anything about it yet. You know, you know a little bit about it. But I always encourage my job seekers to give yourself a chance to be considered for the position. You don't know if it's dream job until you go through the process. And so even if you don't have 100% of the qualifications, but you read that job description and something sparks in you and you think, ooh, if I could get a little bit of training and do that job, I'd really, I could really do that job. You know, that's something I could really be passionate about, but that's a good fit for my skills or something from my background. Go for it and apply. And as Charles mentioned, sometimes you are going to be faced with, I think he called it a bot. So artificial intelligence is definitely a part of the job search process now for lots of large corporations. A lot of uh, companies use applicant tracking systems that employ sophisticated um, computer software to weed through applicants so that it can help HR folks better manage their time. Um, and Cheryl can certainly uh, share her perspective. I'd be really interested to hear that. Um, but that is something that we may be coming across. And so I would say that knowing that, but also even if a company doesn't use that type of system for selection, this technique is still going to help you. And Charles already stole some thunder on that, but I'm glad you did. Uh, <laughs> and that is really every time you apply for a job, you want to target and tailor that resume to that job position. And I think Cheryl mentioned that as well. One of the things that I suggest job seekers do is to when they find a job they want to apply for, cut and paste that job into a Google Doc for yourself and save it. Number one, online positions can expire. And so you might go back to try to find that position and you can't find it anymore. Um, if you're lucky enough to get an interview, you might want to look back at that job description. You'll, you'll be surprised if you're applying for lots of jobs, you might forget the details <laughs> of any particular job you, you might apply for. So it helps with that. But also it can help you to really uh, dig into that job description. And I encourage job seekers to kind of put their empathy hat on and pretend like they're hiring for this position. Hopefully one day you'll be in that position in your career. So so I encourage folks to really look at that job and think, okay, if I'm hiring for this position, what am I really looking for? What are some of the main themes that are popping out? Do they say communication skills six times in that job description? Will that better be on my, my marketing materials somewhere? One of the a great tool or a great technique that I heard about very recently in a, in a webinar that I attended um, was to make use of a free word cloud generator when it comes to the job description. So if you are familiar with a, if you're not, you can Google this, um, but uh, a word cloud generator, and there are a number of free word cloud generators on the internet. What it does is it takes any document that you give it and it creates a word cloud. And the word cloud demonstrates words that appear more often in a bigger font. That, I thought that was a great way. Sometimes mm -hmm. job descriptions are really lengthy, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, it's overwhelming. What are the main themes? I'm really lost. So the word cloud will help you identify the, the words that are appearing more frequently in that job description. And then you can really help, that will help inform how you're gonna target your marketing materials. So for instance, I was working with an Asheville alum a couple of weeks ago. She was, we were working on her cover letter for a position. We played with the word cloud. And it was so interesting because it showed us something I just didn't catch. And it was this tech technology that they wanted somebody to be really comfortable with. That was the biggest word by far. And so we made sure that her cover letter talked about her comfort with technology and software mm -hmm. and those sorts of things. And she told me this week, she's got an interview. So again, you know, a lot of people tell me what Charles said, and that is if I could just get to the interview phase and I can tell my story. Um, and, and even if you feel confident, I would say, I know we're going to talk about that later, but I really suggest that you practice <laughs> before your interview um, so you're really prepared. Um, but uh, it, it can be difficult to 
be competitive in such a competitive job market these days. And most people do not want to take the time to target and tailor their marketing materials. So if you do, that's really going to help you stand out. So on your resume, as Charles mentioned, use the keywords that that job description says. Make sure those are the exact words you're using. You may say that you've done something similar. You may use similar wording. Use the exact wording. That'll help you um, pass through that applicant tracking system. And if human beings are looking at it, they're going to love it. They're going to think, oh, this person has, has taken all the boxes. They have the skills that we're looking for. Uh, and I will say, too, that employers are really interested in seeing those skills in action. So something that we've heard from employers, and again, I'd love Cheryl's feedback later, um, is that they, they've told me that a skills listing on a resume is less effective than those skills in action in the experience section. So, and, and the way that employers have communicated that to me in the past is that anybody can type in that they're, uh, they've got good public speaking skills. I could type that out on a resume, but where's the evidence of that? Mm -hmm. And so I really encourage you to think about um, showing versus telling your skills on your resume and really uh, making sure that you are describing them in a way that shows the results of your skills so that the employer can see, oh, okay, this person has the, this set of skills and could bring these types of results to our organization. And the, something that I'll say about the cover letter is that it's deceptively difficult to write one of these. Uh, I'm sure that you're having to write pages upon pages of research papers and a, you know, very intellectually demanding uh, pieces that you're writing these days and having to research. So you think, oh, a cover letter, no problem, one page, I'll knock that out. Just, I just want to let people know it's difficult for most people because you are trying to talk about yourself and you're trying to, as Brenda mentioned, make a sales pitch for what you have to offer. That, that's what it is. These are marketing materials. It's not your whole story. It's not your whole, you know, hopefully you'll get to tell that in the interview, but it's the highlights of what you want that future employer to know about you. And so your resume is your nuts and bolts, your skills in action, your educational experiences. Make sure that your resume is error free. You don't want to misspell anything. Uh, and, and sometimes we get a great candidate and they misspelled a couple things and they just get put to the no pile. So, you know, make sure that you're um, being very detail oriented with your editing. And it's always great to have somebody else look at your materials. You wouldn't believe the number of students and alumni who misspell Lenore Ryan on their resume. It is not easy to spell. I'm talking about 4.0 <laughs> grads. They're misspelling Lenore Ryan on their resume. I know they're not dumb. They're just not able to, you know, your brain reads something as you expect it to be read. So have somebody else look at your resume before you turn it in. Make sure you're uploading the correct cover letter <laughs> to the correct company. Because again, you could be a great candidate. But some of those missed details can really put you in the no pile very quickly. The other thing I'll say about the cover letter is that you don't want to restate your resume in paragraph form on that cover letter. They're going to see that information from your resume. I encourage folks to talk about soft skills and talk about their passion. You know, if you're in this field, this is something that is, you are probably quite passionate about it. It's something that is very pur purposeful to you and personal to you. And while a cover letter, yes, is a business letter and it should be professional, oh my gosh, we, we want to see that passion. We want to know that you're thrilled to apply for this position. Using language like that is not unprofessional. It can be refreshing when employers are getting the same tired cover letters over and over again, you know. Uh, so if you can interject some of your personality into that cover letter, which again can be challenging to do, but it's worth the effort, that is a great way to, again, stand out from the crowd. The other thing that I think is great to include in the cover letter is a little bit of research that you've done about that company. Not only why do you want that job, but you've researched that company's mission. You've researched that company's values. And you want to mention that in your cover letter as a driving force for why you're interested in this position. Not only you have a good skill set or education that matches with the job description, but you've researched the company and you want to be part of fulfilling their mission. And so those are things, again, that most jobs candidates are not going to take the time to do. So it is well, I know it's time consuming and applications can be lengthy 
And so I get that, but it is well worth the effort to really target and tailor each and every cover letter to each job opportunity in each company. And then I'll say that LinkedIn, is a tool that you definitely want to make sure that you're aware of. If, if you've not heard of LinkedIn, it's social media for the professional world. And of course, since the pandemic started, more and more companies have been relying on LinkedIn than ever before. Um, a lot of companies really value that platform for networking purposes and looking for folks with certain skill sets. Obviously, your LinkedIn profile, you can't tailor to each and every you know, individual company but you wanna think really intentionally about your branding. You want your LinkedIn profile, your resume, your cover letter, and what you say in an interview to all reinforce one another. So one of the first things that you wanna ask yourself, and Charles mentioned this, is what are my strengths? What do I bring to the table here? So think about the core of who you are and make sure that all of your branding reflects that across all of your different channels. And that will definitely help you present yourself much more genuinely and much more authentically. And I believe you're going to find a better match for a company that way. And that's really what it's all about. And we'll talk more about that with interviews, but it's really finding your fit. Again, you're passionate about this work. You want to work with a company that aligns with your values. So all of this research is only going to benefit you in the long run. I'm sure there's a lot more I could say, but I'm sure the panelists will add in what I've forgotten. Thank you. Uh, it might be hard to add to that, but you, you shared a whole lot. But I will run through and see what, what folks uh, want to add. Do we have a volunteer from the panel who wants to jump in? She Anyone did have? such a great job. That was so <laughs> thorough. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. I learned a lot. <laughs> That's yeah. great. I'll, um, I'll, I'll jump in and add a little bit of flavor to a, to a couple of pieces. One, um, when it comes to, you know, leaning into that skill set, for me, um, I knew that I wanted to be in a very public facing relationship driven, essentially sales role, but focused on the sustainability team, right? Um, that was me bringing my extroverted presentation oriented um, people skills um, and, and this desire to bridge relationships with sustainability into practice. And so when I got the interview for a sustainability solutions manager, um, to Katie's first point, I didn't know that much about it, but I knew that I thought I could be a good fit. And so as the process went along, um, and then of course, through my role now, it's been a great blend of my interaction with sales professionals, so I am the liaison between Office Depot's sales team and our customers who are trying to achieve their own sustainability goals and are looking to Office Depot to help them do that. And so in many ways, it's consultative. So I'm doing a lot of consulting type work, um, even though I'm not a consultant, I'm on the sustainability team. Um, but leaning into whether it's writing, whether it's um, IT, whether it's sales and relationship, understanding how you bridge the gap through your skills to help meet a need that a company is experiencing or putting out there based on their job uh, posting is, is really important. For me, that's where it manifested in this sales sustainability bridge um, which has been the perfect fit for me. It's been really great. I wanted to also expand um, by sharing my screen, if I can, just to show um, some practical pieces. And if somebody can let me know when they can see it. Uh, we see it, yeah. I see some some highlights. Great. So I wanted to kind of, kind of put some of this, in, since this was recent for me, into what does it look like on a resume, right? Because it's one thing for us to talk about it. I wanna kind of give you what it looked like for me. And keep in mind, this is my resume. We can talk about design and orientation and everything, but I wanna show you in this first paragraph, the highlighted words are words exactly from the job description, which is almost the entire paragraph. 
when I changed my resume, this was the main thing that I catered to the job description. So I wanted to make sure that those keywords, driving large scale sustainability initiatives, mm -hmm. uh, B2B sales marketing, training sessions, customer focus, all those words hit both the computer requirements and also the next round interview requirements to show, yes, I have the skills. And then once you kind of, at least me, when I put it out there, then the body is where you explain how you did that, right? So I hope that's helpful. I know we're gonna touch on it a little bit more and I'm, I'm sure others have perspectives, but that's where I, I was able to help that manifest in my resume. I love that. That's great. Thanks for sharing that uh, that detail, and I think that's really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I think what we're going to do now is take a very short break. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I think I think most people are back, and uh, we're moving right along and learning a lot. And I'm excited about the next section, which is about interview techniques. Uh, and we're going to have Cheryl kick off talking about not only how to prepare for an interview, but also how to take an be in an interview, and then also how to follow up on an interview. So we'll turn things over to Cheryl now. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm sort of like Keith had mentioned, I'm breaking this up into um, three parts. Essentially, there's that pre-interview prep. As Charles mentioned, and Katie as well, it's, it's getting to know that job description. I love the idea of copying and pasting that job description into a Word document. So if it does come down um, off of the careers page or what have you, you have that to refer to. So that's a wonderful tip. Really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, getting to know that job description, making sure you're, you're going line by line to um, understand what the job means. Clearly you're doing something right if you've nabbed an interview. So you're already doing, um, you're going in a great direction. So um, first I, I wanna talk about connecting with the recruiter. And Charles mentioned that at a career fair, um, it's so incredibly important if you are lucky enough to be applying for a job in a organization that has a recruiting team, um, sometimes, jobs that you apply for, they're not even going to have an HR team. So it, it sort of depends on, on what organization you're applying for, how large they are. Um, we have a recruiting team at Sierra Nevada. Um, to speak a little bit about the bot, we, our recruiters go through applications, but we have something called knockout questions, which sounds incredibly cruel, but it asks about specific qualifications because there are qualifications that say, um, it is required that you have a master's degree. Um, there's also qualifications where it's, it's preferred. And so if you don't have that qualification, you won't be knocked out, so to speak. But um, you, you go through those questions and you need to be honest about that. If you don't have a master's degree, you're not gonna say that you do, and that may knock you out. So um, kudos to all of you for being in grad school. Um, so to keep, speaking on that connection with your recruiter, get to know that recruiter, make that computer, excuse me, recruiter want to help you and want to assist you because you, you can build a relationship. And I'm, we have a wonderful recruiter at Sierra Nevada and that's exactly what she does. She builds relationships with these candidates and she helps them and she encourages them and she helps them get clarity where um, candidates have questions. So that is such an important piece. Um, you're, you know, you're getting prepared for your interview, ask the recruiter who's on the panel. You wanna know who's going to be there at your interview. So if you can get a sneak peek into the names of who's going to be on the panel, if, if he or she you know, knows who that's going to be, maybe what their roles are, that will help you prepare. Um, that's a, a great question to ask. I'm referring to my notes so I don't miss anything. Um, understand what the vision and values, and Katie spoke to this, of the organization are. We at Sierra Nevada have a huge online presence, so it doesn't take much to dig into our company culture, dig into our practices, um, 
we have in fact such a large online presence that if you go into an interview and you don't have the basic understanding of, of what makes the company tick, you don't look really great. Um, you don't really show up the way you would you want to. So do research on the organization that you're applying for. Um, if there's if there's something that you learn online that's kind of interesting or you're curious about or you really align with, jot that down in a note so when you're representing yourself in your interview, you can speak to that. Um, as a panelist that have I've been on many interviews, I really love it when you can tell that candidate did their homework and they have learned about what makes the company tick. They found something interesting. They're not just regurgitating, oh, I love how you guys recycle. You know, there's just, you can tell who's done, who's done their homework and who's passionate. Um, so yeah, taking note of any personal alignment that you have with the company and what speaks to you, really important. Um, and then moving on to that virtual interview experience practice. Have a friend get on a Zoom call with you. Check the sounds. Do you have a dog that's barking? Do you have um, maybe kids at home that could interrupt you and keep your focus away? Um, don't dial in last minute without making sure that you've done a sound check. Um, see what your background is. You can't see my messy kitchen right now because I changed the background. I don't know if this is maybe the best background to have, but it's better than looking into my kitchen right now. So, you know, just be aware of how you're showing up in that virtual space is, is really huge. And by practicing with a friend, you know, have someone that you trust that you're comfortable with say, well, you don't look that great in, in orange, Cheryl. So, you know, maybe think about what you're wearing or, um, you know, I can hear a leaf blower outside. So just be prepared so during the interview you'll come as your best self and you won't be distracted or embarrassed or stressed out about something that you maybe could have taken care of earlier. Um, so the interview itself, um, maybe you have that inside scoop of who the panel is, which is wonderful. Jot that down, have a notebook with you. So you, when you learn these folks, when you learn their names, you're like, okay, the person sitting on the left, that's Judy or you know what have you. If there's a moment to exchange um, niceties with the panel, find out what they do for the organization. Don't be afraid to get to know the panel. Um, don't focus on one panelist. That I've, I've sat in interviews before where it felt like the candidate was only focused on that hiring manager and the rest of the panel just sort of sat there and we weren't really that engaged. And so I think it's important to focus your attention equally as much as you can to the rest of the panel, even though, um, you know, a lot of interviews, we take turns asking questions. So making sure you're answering the question and focusing on the person that's, that's asking that question, but share your attention with the rest of the panel. Don't just focus on maybe the person that you perceive has the most power in the hiring decision. Um, and some of this stuff is, is probably, you probably know this, so I hope I'm not insulting, but don't speak negatively about past or current work experiences um, or organizations, coworkers, anything like that. That's just usually a bad plan. So find a way to put a positive spin on it. Um, if, if you're asked why are you leaving your current organization or why are you looking for a change, it's just that. I'm, I'm ready to grow. I'm ready to learn something new. Um, not, you know, my boss doesn't care about me or, or something like that. Um, finally, during that interview, and I, I hope I'm not missing too much, um, take that opportunity to ask questions, plan out what those questions are so um, you can jot those down on your notes. And if you feel like those questions were answered, maybe you could say, you know, these are some questions I had, but I feel like I, I have these answered already. Um, that isn't your time to ask about salary. Um, that isn't your time to ask about like, you know, vacation or anything like that. That's information that you can ask your recruiter. Wouldn't recommend bringing that up in an interview. Um, let's see, just make sure I got everything. Okay, I think I've got everything here. So post interview, this is a really great reason to jot down who's on the panel. Um, 
you want to send them a quick email. We've had people that go to the trouble of sending cards, lovely gesture, not necessary. Um, you're in sustainability. Maybe that's not um, showing up as sustainable as maybe just sending an email and an email is fine. And we usually, when we get an email, we share it amongst the panel. Oh, I got an email from the candidate. And it's um, really helpful if you can remember something that the panelist said that struck you, but obviously be genuine about it. Um, but if it's something that really resonated, make sure you mention it. Um, I love hearing that. It, it's a compliment and we all, um, we all could use a compliment here and there. And I think that's all I've got, but I, I might think of something else. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. That's that's hugely helpful. And uh, I'm going to move on to other panelists and see if there are other insights that anyone wants to add. Um, maybe maybe I go to Katie next. How's that sound? Sure, absolutely. Um, I always love hearing from the people on the other side of the table. This is so valuable, folks. These are the decision makers. So it's so helpful to hear these perspectives, and I'm so glad we get to share that with our students. Um, so again, just, just reminding our current students, we can do practice interviews with you in the Career Center. That is so helpful. Um, you know, I think as somebody mentioned here, someone could be a great candidate and then just you maybe not have been coached on some interview skills. Interview skills are different than maybe some of the skills you're learning in your program. So humble yourself <laughs> to ask for help and um, know that we're not coming from a place of judgment, just like those um, recruiters, right? We're here to help you. We want to be, we want you to be successful. So you can make some mistakes with us and we'll help you work through some of those and give you some techniques. If you say, um, a lot, you know, we've got some tips for you. If you move around a lot, you know, you may not even be, you may, you may not realize you're doing this the whole interview. <laughs> I see this sometimes, you know, and then somebody else can tell you that. Um, so I think that's great advice. Something else that I like to encourage our folks to do is to prepare star stories ahead of time. So in interviews, it's common to get behavioral based interview questions. So like, tell me about a time when you led a project. Tell me about a time when you had a conflict with a coworker and how you, mm -hmm. how did you deal with that? You know, those kinds of questions, those help the folks see, you know, the best predictor of your future behavior is your past behavior. But on the spot, it can be really tough to come up with appropriate examples that are going to help you illustrate your strengths. So what we encourage folks to do is again, looking at that job description, what are the top three to five strengths that you would bring to that job? Okay, so think about that, identify that. I'm gonna stretch you, think about three to five, not just one, okay. And then think about times when you displayed that strength and then come up with a star story. So star stands for situation, task, action, result. That's a nice framework to keep your story concise. Something that I personally struggle with in interviews is that I'm passionate about what I do too, so I can ramble and I can just get ahead of myself and share details that aren't relevant. So that star technique helps you keep the answer concise, but the more specific your story is, the better, right? Then, then somebody like Cheryl can really get a picture of you in action. Not just, yes, I, I lead teams well, Great, you know, mm -hmm. but then if you have an example of a group project that you led in, in your program, you know, and, and what role you took and how that ended up, a lot of folks just kind of naturally forget to share the result. And we received an A on the project or, and we, you know, were able to save this company's electric bill or, you know, whatever the result was. Um, so I would encourage folks to come up with star stories. Mm -hmm. And I love Cheryl's tip of bring a notebook with you. That's one of the things in virtual interviews, you can have all sorts of papers spread out on your desk if you want to. And then if you're eventually when we're able to have in-person interviews, more often, um, having a pad folio to just kind of keep everything nice and neat and then be able to um, take notes in your note notebook is a great thing to bring with you. But go ahead and write those stories down for yourself. Mm -hmm. Again, you're going to be nervous in that interview. It's going to be hard to remember, flip through the memory banks to think of an appropriate example. So if you've already thought of those ahead of time, they can apply to lots of different types of, of interview questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. Brenda? Charles, you want to jump in? 
Um, I, I want to throw something in here that might need a little more time, but I like to think of reverse behavioral interview questions. So my questions for the employer or the hiring manager is to turn it and create behavioral questions for them. So I, so if I've identified my values ahead of time and what's important to me, I'll ask a question to find out how they handle things. So um, it could be like, tell me about a time when you had a new star employee, what they did, how you let them know they were doing a good job and what the long-term result was. Now, why this is tricky is one of the things that really matters to me is tell me about a time when you had to let somebody go. What happened? How did you communicate that? And what was the result? So right now in my own mind, I'm a little conflicted because some of what I'm trying to uncover is their management style. And I only want to do it from a positive standpoint. But some of what my real questions are, like, do you really treat people fairly and give them a fair shot? And am I going to get blindsided? So that's just some of my own personal stuff coming through. But I do recommend in the questions you form going into it that they aren't just trying to gather information, but trying to get them to tell their stories. And they'll recognize that. They'll just be telling you all kind of stuff and not even know it. So you can really pick up on their values. And then I just love the star. And, and that's just, you know, a great tip for preparing for an interview. So thanks. Thank you so much. Charles, do you want to add anything? Are you? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add briefly. The, the couple of things that come to my mind are give yourself grace as you're going through this process. Because it is just like learning a new sport or practicing a skill. And the more times that you go through interviews, even if you feel like you have completely bombed it, you have learned something and you can grow from that and be better next time. So that was a big part of it for me because I did hundreds, hundreds of interviews, right? Throughout the, throughout the past couple of years, and I had to give myself a lot of grace to say, yeah, I really messed up on that one, but you know what? I know what to do better for this next time. So um, that's one piece. And then uh, the second is be yourself. Don't show up to the interview be trying to be somebody that you're not. If you are not confident in the skills that you are bringing to the table, you need to understand how your skills and your unique skill set and unique personality is going to mesh with that organization. And that's where your research comes in handy. That's where your unique role as a sustainability professional comes in handy. But be yourself and be your authentic self because you're confident that your skills and your personality and your culture will be a good fit with that organization. Charles, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, oh, I, that's something I encourage our folks to do as well. And to, with, along those lines, think of an interview as, uh, it, it's not just you on trial. You know, we feel that way, right? It's like, okay, we're going to be grilled. We better say the right thing. You know, we want to be on that team. Well, you don't know if you want to be on that team yet. You're, you are evaluating them just as much as they're evaluating you. And I like to tell folks that because it can take the pressure off. You know, not that you're not trying to be impressive. Yes, um, it's kind of like a first date. Do we want to be liked? Yes. Uh, if we're fake, will we make it last a while? Maybe, yeah. But uh, if we're fake on that first date, six months later, nobody's happy. Same thing with a job. <laughs> so I love that idea of just showing up with your real self and being very genuine. And, and, and you are assessing if this is where you want to give your talents and time and energy. How much time do we spend at work, right? Lots of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we want to make sure it's an environment where we think we're going to fit as well. And I know there are going to be times in our life where we need a J-O-B and we can't be picky. Okay. I know that. And so you may need to get that job, <laughs> but hopefully you're investing in your master's degree 
to you know have some options mm-hmm. to be able to align with a company that that is really meaningful for you, especially with what you're studying. And as Charles shared, you know it may take a couple um, uh, you know tries to to really find that fit. Um, but that's really what an interview is all about. From the co- you know from the company's perspective, they're looking for a fit, and so are you. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you all. There is a question that I, I think we can entertain right now. Uh, Dave Gordon asks, Cheryl, have you seen folks ask the kind of reverse questions that Brenda brings up? Uh, and if so, how did it go? Is that something that you've come across in interviews? Um, That's these- a great question. Um, and I, I did want to add a little piece that I forgot earlier, but I'll, I'll go to Dave's question first. I have not heard um, that question per se, but I have had some candidates ask some great questions of the panelists. They ask me, um, what do you like best about your job? Or um, how does how do you partner with the managers here? How does HR partner with um, the management team? How does, what services do HR um, provide to employees? Those kind of things. I don't know if I've ever heard of um, a question like Brenda brought up exactly, but questions that I think um, unlock some information about company culture, definitely, and I think they're really important. And then one thing I forgot as far as follow-up after the interview, um, follow up with that recruiter because you're building that relationship with the recruiter and after your interview, you could call them right away and just say, oh, I just finished the interview. I think it went really well. And just continue building that that relationship with your recruiter. And also make sure, you know, you've got the correct spelling for the panelists if you're going to do a follow-up email, that kind of thing. But again, it's it's continuing to build that relationship. Thanks. Excellent. Well, I think we're going to pick up where Charles left off, which is learning from the process, which is the next part of this. And we're going to uh, we're going to do that. I'm going to remove everyone from the spotlight, uh, and we're going to do that in a slightly shorter format than I initially imagined. Uh, and and so this is what we're going to do now. So, as Charles pointed out, is perfect segue here um, that this is a learning process the whole time, the whole experience of your journey of looking for a career and especially the job search process and finding that job is something that is challenging and always opportunities to learn are within it. And so uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into little breakout groups uh, and we're gonna do something really simple, which is what challenges have you faced in any stage of the job search and, um, and, and wh- what are you uncertain about? And what we're gonna try and do is we're gonna put a, a different panelist in each of the rooms and w- together we're gonna brainstorm um, some, some ideas. That doesn't mean we're gonna come up with the right answers, but um, another thing that we're trying to emphasize here is that we all need support as we're going through this process and the extent to which we can build a little support around that, uh, the, the better the process is gonna be for all of us. So I'm gonna put you all into, um, into breakout rooms. I hope it doesn't take too long. Um, so yeah, I'm going to send you there. I'm going to have a few people share out uh, one one thing that your group uh, explored. Who wants to go first? You're all muted, just so you know. Keith, I'll go. Oh, great. We uncovered four, so I want to give you the others later. Um, one was when a job description has 15 things they're looking for, how do you choose which ones to highlight and which ones to address in your cover letter? Interesting, that's a great question. <clears throat> while, while we're on that topic, uh, does anyone have an, an idea about that? We might as well use this as an opportunity to explore that and not just leaving as a hanging question. Uh, Cheryl, you're muted, you, you can go. Um, yeah. The, the order usually that that the skills are, are listed in the job description is usually the order of importance, at least from my perspective and from what I've seen. So I would I would focus on that. Um, that's that's my thought on it. Excellent. Other thoughts? Thank you. Um, the person that posed the question said, I like that word cloud idea. Maybe I can use that. So great idea. I love that idea. Yep. What's another group? Uh, something to share from a different group. 
So I'll take this. Um, from our group there, we talked about um, getting the automated thanks but no thanks letter and never really, you know, having a connection with a person behind it. It's an automated letter and maybe what you can do. I think those can really beat you up, um, especially if you're applying for many, many jobs and to keep receiving those is, can be really painful and discouraging. Um, and so our thought was see if you can get a person on the phone to at least talk it out and, and maybe see where your gaps are, especially if that letter is vague and not giving you a lot of information. Um, and um, another thing that was brought up that was really great is when you're crafting your experience to match this job, how far is it? And I'm, I'm not saying this exactly how it was asked, but what is reasonable for a stretch? Um, is it, you know, you're really stretching the facts and there's, it's getting to the point of it's not really true anymore, or you just sort of, you're using what you have and you're building it up to, to make a, a better match. Um, so those were our two topics. Great. Uh, great. One more from a, a different group. Somebody had to jump off early, but they let me know. I knew about it. Yeah, I guess we're the third group here. So um, uh, we talked a little bit about technology and engaging and networking via technological platforms. Um, LinkedIn, you know, was mentioned as uh, its benefits that it brings. And we explored thinking about how best to leverage that both as a kind of like an address book, a uh, collection of your contacts and ways to reach out to people via messaging. Mm -hmm. And then also ways to share your your material, um, whether it's something you've written or a post, um, and using that to market yourself. Excellent. Well, thank you all. I think I mean, of course, that the the process of learning about this is uh, never ending. We can keep learning, and um, and I think building the support team is something that uh, Brenda would strongly suggest, and we all would uh, follow. And uh, what we're going to do next is talk about we got a job and uh, what do we do? And so uh, there's an offer, landing a job and negotiating a contract. And I I'm going to spotlight Cheryl to talk about that first and then we'll, we'll run through the panel. Um, and here's just the deal. We, we have just 10 minutes left or so. Um, so it's going to be shorter than, than, than usual. Um, and, and any Q and A, um, you, if you post it, I'll find a way to get answers for you. So um, beyond this, and I, I'm hoping that everyone, if you're, if you need to leave, there's a, a survey, um, very short. Uh, I'll send it by email. If you don't get to it, I'll put it in the chat right after um, Cheryl and the rest of the team are done. So Cheryl, let's talk about what happens when we get a job and offer. Okay, so that's that's such an exciting um, thought. You you landed a job. You've got a job offer. So. Um, yeah, so that's wonderful. Um, you know, you're gonna your recruiter is, is gonna be excited and excited to, to share the, the salary that they can offer you and all the other goodies that come with it. Um, I think if you're if you're interested in negotiation and you would like to negotiate that salary, maybe it's a little under what you're currently making now. Um, absolutely appropriate. They're not going to rescind your job offer because you asked for more. Um, however, because of things like compression in um, salary grades of the current people that are working in this department, you know, maybe they just can't and that's, that's not going to work. They won't be able to um, negotiate salary, but perhaps they'd be willing to negotiate uh, PTO or vacation. Um, perhaps they'd be willing to assist with relocation. If you are needing to relocate to a different city where the job is, I think that's part of the negotiation process. Um, at Sierra Nevada, we have a, a reload plan and I think a lot of organizations do. Sometimes before we actually had a, a formal plan, we didn't offer relocation unless the candidate asked for it. So asking for um, what you need is, is really important. And again, they're not going to think negatively of you. This is all part of it. And um, they're not going to rescind your offer because you're asking for more. You may not get it, but you're never gonna get it if you don't ask for it. Um, that's, 
that's all I've got on that piece, Keith. Perfect. What? Well, who? Who? What, should we go to Katie next? I know this is yes. a, also a huge passion of hers. Yes. <laughs> uh, and yes. So, um, but it, it, one of the reasons that I like to talk with folks about it is probably a little personal. I, you know, it's it's challenging to do, right? You know, you kind of you're nervous about it, and should I or shouldn't I? And Charles has mentioned a couple of times, you know, understanding your value, understanding your worth. So that's, this is a, this is again, something that takes practice, I think, to get confident with. Um, just because of some uh, alums that I've worked with in the past, and I know this has happened, I'd like to share that between the, the negotiation period is between the offer and your acceptance. It doesn't happen after you accept it, the negotiation period is over. <laughs> you cannot, you know, it's not appropriate to go to the employer after you've accepted the position and then try to try to change anything. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Is that in line with what you yes, think? Yes, that's absolutely true, Katie. Because I've I've had some, you know, just folks tell me that they've tried to do that. That's just not usually gonna work. Um, so that's good to know. And then I also just encourage people, again, even if it's dream job, it is a good idea to give yourself a little bit of a window of time to think about it, um, to tell that recruiter, thank you so much for this offer. I'm so excited. I, I, I want to, you know, make an intentional choice, as you probably want me to as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the you know one of the worst things you can do is rescind your your acceptance um, uh, and and say that you accept the position and then go back later and say actually I can't take that position you know that would just look so terribly on you you would be the it would reflect negatively on you um, so it's good to think about it uh, I think it's good to ask that employer what their timeline is you know may I have until Monday if the offer's on a Friday may I have until mm -hmm. this certain date um, if you have a current employer. Um, okay, and I'm saying this because this has happened to someone that I've worked with. Um, if you have a current employer and you want to give them a chance to try to keep you, that is during that negotiation period. Um, I had an alum one time who accepted an offer, went to their employer, their employer offered them something they just could not refuse. And so then they rescinded their acceptance and just looked terribly with the new employer. So again, that is the time to go to your current employer if you have one and, and either, maybe you just want to give notice. Maybe you don't want them to try to keep you, or maybe there's nothing they could do to try to keep you and that's fine, but that's the time to do that. And then I love um, Cheryl's perspective of maybe if they, if they can't um, uh, negotiate on that salary, absolutely pay time off, vacation days, maybe a remote day, one day a week. You know, I think employers are definitely more flexible than ever. That's one thing the pandemic accelerated. It was happening, but oh, it's now, <laughs> you know, in a different stratosphere. But I think employers are more open to that now. So again, think about your values, what's important to you. You could potentially have more time off and that is that may be just as valuable to you as as the numbers. Um, the other thing that I would say, again, it can be a nerve wracking process to negotiate. So the more knowledge that you have and the more information you have, the more confident you'll be. And so I encourage you to do your research as to what are the salaries for this type of position in this certain geographical area. And you really wanna take that into account. Um, a, a role in Washington, D.C. is going to be different because of cost of living than um, maybe where you're from. So that's a good idea. Research the salaries for the positions that you are applying for in that geographical area and um, kind of use that as your basis for negotiation. Um, it's never a good idea to, um, in my opinion, share your personal finances as to why you want a certain salary. <laughs> you know, I got this loan to pay back. I got this rent. I'm paying on this. That's not, that's not something you want to bring up in a, <laughs> to your employer. Uh, that's not something that you want to, that's not relevant to this conversation. It's more about your value in the company and your value in that role. And so the research isn't necessarily what your personal finances are, but, um, what, um, again, what value you feel that you have in that particular role. I've also heard a suggestion from an employer one time that said, well, we, you know, we can't 
um, we may not be able to offer a different salary in the in the beginning stages, but if they say, you know, it's my goal to show you that I am worth however much more over the course of six months to a year, mm -hmm. you know, I'm willing to accept this offer as is, but, you know, can we reevaluate in a year? You know, my goal will be to show you I'm worth this amount of money. And again, every employer is going to be different. And so again, that's where your network is invaluable. If you know somebody that works for that company, they can give you an idea of what the culture is all about. And if that's something that's going to fly at that type of institution. Um, I know that government institutions often publish the salary range. And so that gives you a really clear idea of what to expect. And a lot of times with government entities, there's not a lot of wiggle room. That's it, that's the range. You can't go higher than that. You might get to the top of the range when you first start, but in that type of setting, um, there can be a, a little bit more um, rigidity there in terms of salary. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a question uh, that I want to answer. Are there any strategies that marginalized groups of people might use to understand what pay differences might be present for particular jobs? Um, I don't know if anybody knows, but it was equal pay day yesterday. So the federal government um, mm -hmm. decided that yesterday was going to be equal pay day, and there was some press uh, surrounding that. And that's really exciting because right now there's certainly a gender gap in, in salaries. So, um, you know, women tend to make less than men in the similar role. Um, women of color, even more so, there's the gap is even wider. And so a great tip that I heard during a webinar this week about women in the workplace overcoming discrimination and, and, and advancing in their career uh, was to, again, seek out mentorship, seek out networking connections that can help you uh, be more, be maybe a little bit more savvy to um, know how, you know, how far to push or how far to negotiate. Um, there is always a measure of risk, right? When you negotiate, you know, there's a chance that they could say no, and then you have to decide, is that okay with you? Um, and so there's a little bit of risk there, but I think we can get more confident with some research, with some talking mm -hmm. with mentors, with talking with networking contacts. Um, and uh, there's also a movement to move away from asking what your previous salary was. Sometimes that can pigeonhole us. We were, maybe we were underpaid there. And again, mm -hmm. if we're a woman or a woman of color, we're probably grossly underpaid. So we don't want to stick with that same genre. We want to move beyond that. And so there's a movement to not ask about salary history, but salary expectations. Uh, That's illegal that in California. Um, Ooh, good to know. Yeah, that is illegal. And, and we have, we don't use that practice as well at Sierra Nevada. And I think it's, it's becoming a little more or less common that people ask about what they're currently making. Um, to add really super quick, there's here comes your friendly recruiter again. In this process, ask your recruiter what the pay range is and um, they should be able to give you an idea of what the max is going to be. And if you can't see yourself surviving on the max of that pay range, um, you may wanna cut early. You know, if it's something you can do and work your finances a little bit and make it work, but chances are, if you're hired into an organization, they're not going to pay the change the pay range around you. It's going to be where you're placed in that pay range. Mm -hmm. But your recruiter should be able to share that with you. Excellent, and and thank you for addressing those questions. And it looks like people are also answering questions of each other in the chat. Um, I just posted also a, a link for a quick assessment, a survey about. Uh, what worked well tonight, what, what you wish was different, and areas that you would like to, uh, to see us dive deeper into in a follow-up to this um, later in the year, perhaps in the fall um, or in the summer. So, um, but before we go, it's eight o'clock, and uh, I, want, uh, I want to say thank you to all the panelists so much, and I'll just give them uh, a chance to say goodbye to all of you in whatever way they want to say um, goodbye and if they have a tip or a word of wisdom or uh, an encouragement. Um, Charles, why don't you start? Sure. So um, 
I'll, I'll reiterate what I started with, that this is an incredibly exciting time to be in the sustainability space. Corporations across this country are looking for sustainability professionals with the skills that uh, this program prepares you for. So I encourage you to be confident in yourself, um, keep humility, um, and understand how you best fit into whatever organization you are trying to go into and how you help them to be better by meeting a specific need mm -hmm. or a gap that they have. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, I did post just quickly, Job Scan is a great tool for scanning job postings and your resume, and it'll highlight which words you're missing. Um, so highly recommend that tool. Um, thanks so much. Hope to continue this conversation. You guys can do it. Thanks so much. Brenda. Uh, I'm wondering, Keith, can you capture what is in the chat or will we? Well, there is, is in, the, it, in the recording it is there, but my experience with the recording of Zoom chats is that they're always incomplete. So I can see what I can do uh, to capture more of that. I just need to know because I wanna grab some of this, but I'm gonna do a quick cut and paste. And so I'm taking care of Cutting myself. Cutting and pasting is what I would do, so. Yes, I got that. <laughs> in my, so in my I just wanna say I've stuff. been, um, in the working world for more years than I really want to say out loud. And this was one of the best, most useful, jam-packed, everything in one uh, career event I've, I've ever been a part of. So just thank you to everybody. And I'm glad it's recorded. Um, I can think of three people I'm going to share it with. <laughs> Excellent. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, too. And I know you have tons of other resources that you might also uh, speak to. Cheryl, why don't you give a word of wisdom or... or yeah, I uh, um, really enjoyed um, being on this panel. It was, it was tons of fun. Loved what everyone else had to say. There was so much wisdom in this room, and it's, it's so great to um, have this resource for the students. So, and it's a great resource for me as well. So very... Um, thankful for this. So just um, words of wisdom, show grace for yourself. Um, you know, when you get those, the disappointing news, um, adjust your approach maybe, and don't give up. I think asking for some feedback, use that recruiter relationship. Um, and, and maybe it is, you need a little adjustment. You still want to be yourself, but you maybe just need to tweak an approach a little bit. And um, yeah, just don't give up and and believe in yourself. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you. And Katie. Absolutely, I agree with what everybody has said so far. And I would just say, keep taking advantage of opportunities like this, mm -hmm. webinars and networking events, and just soak it all up. I've learned a lot today too. And I would also just remind everybody, you are not in this by yourself. Everybody needs a village, not just parents. We all need a village at all points in our lives. And so know that you can reach out to a support network to help you navigate this sometimes daunting and ego bruising process. But um, there are folks here for you. Uh, we certainly are. And there are folks who are, you're not gonna bother people when you ask for help. So definitely um, reach out and know that you've got a support network that's here to help you. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. I really appreciate all the uh, all the great ideas that were brought, all the insights, and all the participation for the students who uh, are on the journey and are here to build a better world. I really appreciate uh, what we're trying to do together. So uh, I'll see you all in class or otherwise. <laughs> and except Casey, great to meet you. And um, I'm going to have to end things here because I want to be respectful of everyone's time. But thanks. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Nice to meet you Bye. all.